Uh, so we spent a bunch of time in the last couple of lectures talking about different kinds of uh, testing, about unit testing versus integration testing. We talked about how to use RSpec to really isolate the parts of your code you want to test. Uh, you've also, you know, because of homework three and, uh, and other stuff, we've been doing BDD, where we've been using Cucumber to turn user stories into essentially integration and acceptance tests. So you've seen testing at a couple of different levels. And the goal here is to sort of do a few remarks to, to uh, you know, let's back up a little bit and see the big, big picture and tie those things together. So this sort of spans uh, material that covers three or four sections in the book. And I wanted to just hit the high points in lecture. So uh, a question that comes up, I'm sure has come up for all of you as you've been doing the homework, is how much testing is enough? And uh, sadly, for, uh, for a long time, kind of if you ask this question in industry, the answer was basically, well, we have a shipping deadline. So however much testing we can do before that deadline, that's, that's how much, right? It's what you have time for. Um, so that, you know, that's a little flip, obviously not very good. Uh, so you can do a bit better, right? There are some static measures, like how many lines of code does your app have, and how many lines of tests do you have? And it's not unusual in industry, uh, you know, in a, a well-tested piece of software, for the number of lines of test to go uh, far beyond the number of lines of code. So in integer multiples are not unusual, and I think even for sort of, you know, research code or classwork, uh, a ratio of, you know, maybe 1.5 is not unreasonable. So one and a half times the amount of uh, test code as you have application code. Um, and in a lot of production systems where they really care about testing, it's much higher than that. Uh, so maybe a better question to ask, rather than saying how much testing is enough, is to ask how good is the testing I'm doing now? How thorough is it? Um, later in the semester, uh, Professor Sen will talk about uh, a little bit about formal methods and sort of what's at the, the frontiers of testing and debugging. Uh, but a couple of things that we can talk about based on what you already know is uh, uh, some basic concepts about test coverage. And although uh, I would say, you know, we've been saying all along formal methods, they don't really work on big systems. I think that statement, in my personal opinion, is actually a lot less true than it used to be. I think there is a number of specific places, especially in testing and debugging, where formal methods are actually making fast progress. And, and uh, Koshik Sen is, is one of the leaders in that. So you'll have the opportunity to hear more about that later. Uh, but uh, for the moment, I think kind of bread and butter is let's talk about coverage measurement because this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of uh, how you'd be evaluated if you were doing this for real. So what are some basics? Here's a really simple class we can use to talk about different ways to measure how our tests cover this code. Uh, and there's a few different levels. There's different terminology. It's not really universal uh, across all software houses. But uh, one common set of terminology that the book exposes is we could talk about S0, where it just means you've called every method once. So, you know, if you call foo and you call bar, you're done, right? That's S0 coverage, not terribly thorough. Uh, a little more stringent, S1, is you could say we're calling every method from every place that it could be called. So what does that mean? It means, for example, it's not enough to call bar. You have to make sure that you call it at least once from in here, as well as calling it once from any exterior function that might call it. Uh, C0, which is what SimpleCov measures, uh, those of you who have uh, gotten SimpleCov up and running, uh, basically says you've executed every statement. You've touched every statement in your code once. But the caveat there is that uh, conditionals really just count as a single statement. So if you, no matter which branch of this if you took, as long as you touch one or the other branch, you've executed the if statement. So even C0 is still, you know, sort of superficial coverage. But as we'll see, the way that you really want to read this information is if you're getting bad coverage at the C0 level, then you have really, really bad coverage. Right? So if you're not even kind of making this simple level of superficial coverage, then your, your testing is probably deficient. Uh, C1 is the next step up from that. We could say, well, we have to take every branch in both directions. So when we're doing this if statement, we have to make sure that we do the, true, the if x part once and the if not x part at least once uh, to meet C0, uh, to meet C1, excuse me. Um, you can augment that with decision coverage, saying, well, if we're going to... Uh, if we have if statements where the condition is made up of multiple terms, we have to make sure that every sub-expression has been evaluated in both directions, right? So in other words, that means that uh, if we were going to fail this if statement, we have to make sure we fail it at least once because y was false and at least once because z was false. In other words, any sub-expression that could independently change the outcome of the condition has to be exercised in both directions. Um, and then kind of the, the one that, you know, a lot of people aspire to, uh, but there's disagreement on how much more valuable it is, is you take every path through the code, right? And obviously this is kind of difficult because it tends to be exponential in the number of conditions. Um, and, whoops, sorry about that. Um, 
And in general, it's difficult to evaluate if you've taken every path through the code. There are formal techniques that you can use to tell you where the holes are. Uh, but the bottom line is that in uh, most commercial software houses, there's, I would say, not complete consensus on how much more valuable C2 is compared to C0 or C1. Uh, so I think for the purposes of our class, so that you get exposed to the idea of how to use coverage information, uh, SimpleCov takes advantage of some built-in Ruby features to give you C0 coverage. It re does really nice reports where you can sort of see at the, at the level of individual lines in your file. You can see um, what your coverage is. And I think that's kind of a, you know, a good start for where we are. So having seen sort of different flavors of tests, um, what are, you know, stepping back and looking at the big picture, what are some examples of different kinds of tests that we've seen concretely? And what are the trade-offs between using those different kinds of tests? So we've seen uh, at the level of individual classes or methods, we used RSpec with extensive use of mocking and stubbing. Uh, so for example, when we do testing methods in the model, that would be an example of unit testing. We also did something that is uh, pretty similar to functional or module testing, where there's more than one module participating. So for example, when we did controller specs, we saw that we simulate a post action. But remember that the post action has to go through the routing subsystem before it gets to the controller. Once the controller is done, it'll try to render a view. So in fact, there's other pieces that collaborate with the controller that have to be working in order for controller specs to pass. So that's somewhere in between. We're, we're doing more than a single method, touching more than a single class, but we're still concentrating attention on a fairly narrow slice of the system at a time, and we're still using mocking and stubbing extensively to sort of isolate that behavior that we want to test. Um, and then at the level of Cucumber scenarios, these are more like integration or system tests, right? They're, they exercise complete paths through the application. They probably touch a lot of different modules. <clears throat> they make minimal use of mocks and stubs because part of the goal of an integration test is exactly to test the interactions between pieces. So you don't want to stub or control those interactions. You actually want to let the system do what it would really do if this was a scenario happening in production. So how would we compare these different kinds of tests? There's a few different axes we can look at. Uh, one of them is how long they take to run. Now, both RSpec and Cucumber have kind of high startup times and stuff like that. But as you'll see, as you start adding more and more RSpec tests and using auto tests to run them in the background, by and large, once RSpec kind of gets off the launching pad, it runs specs really fast. Whereas running Cucumber features just takes a long time. It has to essentially fire up your entire application. Um, and later in the semester, we'll see a way to make Cucumber even slower, which is to have it fire up an entire browser, basically act like a puppet remote controlling Firefox so that you can test JavaScript code. Uh, we'll do that later. And we actually, uh, I think, uh, we'll be able to work with our friends at Sauce Lab so you can do that in the cloud. That'll be exciting. So it runs fast versus runs slow. Uh, resolution. If an error happens in your unit test, it's usually pretty easy to figure out and track down what the source of that error is because the tests are so isolated, right? You've stubbed out everything that doesn't matter, and you're focusing only on the behavior of interest. So if you've done a good job at doing that, um, when something goes wrong in one of your tests, there's not a lot of places that something could have gone wrong. Uh, in contrast, if you're running a cucumber scenario that's got you know, 10 steps, and every step is touching a whole bunch of pieces of the app, it could take a long time to actually get to the bottom of a bug. right? So it's kind of, kind of a trade-off between uh, how well can you localize errors. Um, coverage. It's possible if you write a good suite of unit and functional tests, you can get really high coverage. right? You can run your simple cov report, and you can actually identify specific lines in your files that have not been exercised by any test, and then you can go write a test that covers them. So figuring out how to improve your coverage, for example, at the C0 level, uh, is something much more easily done with unit tests. Whereas you know, with a Cucumber test, uh, with a Cucumber scenario, you are touching a lot of parts of the code, but you're doing it very sparsely. Right? So if your goal is to get your coverage up, use the tools that are at the unit level so that you can really focus on understanding what parts of my code are under-tested, and then you can write very targeted tests just to focus on them. Um, and sort of uh, you know, putting those pieces together, uh, the unit tests, because of their isolation and their fine resolution, tend to use a lot of mocks to isolate the behaviors you don't care about. But that means that, by definition, you're not testing the interfaces. And it's, it's sort of a received wisdom in software that a lot of the interesting bugs occur at the interfaces between pieces and not sort of within a class or within a method. Right? Those are sort of the easy bugs to track down. Um, and at the other extreme, the more you get towards the integration testing uh, extreme, you're supposed to rely less and less on mocks for that exact reason. Now, we saw if you're testing something like uh, in a service-oriented architecture where you have to interact with a remote site, you still end up having to do a fair amount of mocking and stubbing so that you don't rely on the internet in order for your test to pass. But generally speaking, you're, you're trying to remove as, you know, remove as many of the mocks as you can and let the system run the way it would run in real life. 
So, and the, the good news is you are testing the interfaces, but when something goes wrong in one of the interfaces, because your uh, resolution is not as good, it may take longer to figure out what it is, right? So what's, what, what's sort of the, the high order bit uh, from you know, this trade-off is you don't really want to rely too heavily on any one kind of test, right? They serve different purposes. And depending on are you trying to exercise your interfaces more, are you trying to improve your fine-grained coverage, uh, that affects how you develop your test suite um, and you evolve it along with your software. So um, we've used a certain set of terminology in testing. It's the terminology that, by and large, is uh, most commonly used in the Rails community. But there is some variation on uh, other terms that you might hear if you go get a job somewhere and, and you hear about mutation testing, which we haven't done. Uh, this is an interesting idea that was, uh, I think, invented by uh, uh, Aman and Alfut, who have sort of the definitive book on software testing. The idea is, suppose I introduce a deliberate bug into my code. Does that force some test to fail? Because if I change you know, if x to if not x, and no tests fail, then either I'm missing some test coverage, or my app is very strange and somehow non-deterministic. Um, fuzz testing, which uh, Koshik Sen may talk more about, basically it, this is the 10,000 monkeys at typewriters throwing random input at your code. Uh, what's interesting about it is that the tests we've been doing essentially are crafted to test the app the way it was designed. And these, you know, fuzz testing is about testing the app in ways it wasn't meant to be used. Right? So what happens if you throw enormous form submissions? What happens if you put control characters in your forms? Uh, what happens if you submit the same thing over and over? And uh, Koshik has a statistic that uh, Microsoft finds up to 20% of their bugs using uh, some variation of fuzz testing, and that about 25% of the common uh, Unix command line programs can be made to crash with, through uh, aggressive fuzz testing. <clears throat> uh, define and use coverage is something that we haven't done, but it's another interesting concept. Uh, the, the idea is that at any, any point in my program, there's a place where I define or I assign a value to some variable, and then there's a place downstream where presumably I'm going to consume that value. Someone's going to use that value. Have I covered every pair? In other words, do I have tests where every pair of defining a variable and using it somewhere uh, is executed as some part of my test suite? So it's sometimes called DU coverage. Um, and other terms that I, I think are not as widely used anymore, uh, black box versus white box or black box versus glass box. Roughly, a black box test is one that is written from the point of view of the external specification of the thing, right? This is a hash table. When I put in a key, I should get back a value. If I delete the key, the value shouldn't be there. That's a black box test because it doesn't say anything about how the hash table is implemented. and It doesn't try to stress the implementation. A corresponding white box test might be, I know something about the hash function, and I'm going to deliberately create uh, hash keys in my test cases that cause a lot of hash collisions to make sure that I'm testing that part of the functionality, right? Now, a C0 coverage tool uh, like SimpleCov would reveal that if all you had was black box tests, you might find that the collision coverage code wasn't being hit very often. And that might tip you off and say, OK, if I really want to strengthen that, if I want to boost my coverage of those tests, now I have to write a white box or a glass box test. I have to look inside, see what the implementation does, and find specific ways to try to, to break the implementation in evil ways. So I think you know, a lot of the message of t testing is kind of a way of life, right? It's, it's now that we, you know, we're, we've gotten away from the phase of we build the whole thing and then we test it. Uh, and we've gotten into the phase of we're testing as we go. Testing is really more like a development tool. And like so many development tools, the effectiveness of it depends on whether you use it in a tasteful manner. So you, know, you, you could say, well, let's see. Uh, I kicked the tires. You know, I, I fired up the browser. I tried a couple of things. Looks like it works. Deploy it. Uh, that's you know, obviously a little more cavalier than you want to be. And by the way, if, you know, one of the things that we've discovered with uh, this online course just starting up, when 60,000 people are enrolled in a course and 0.1% of those people have a problem, you get 60 emails. Okay, so if your site, the corollary is if your site is being used by a lot of people, some stupid bug that you didn't find but could have found by testing is, could very quickly generate a lot of pain. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to be dogmatic and say, uh, until we have 100% coverage and every test is green, we absolutely will not ship. Right? That's not healthy either. And the test quality doesn't necessarily correlate with this statement. Unless you can say something about the quality of your test, just because you've executed every line doesn't mean that you've tested the interesting cases. So you know, somewhere in between, you can say, well, we'll use coverage tools to identify under-tested or, or poorly tested parts of the code, and we'll use them as a guideline to sort of help improve our overall confidence level. Right? But remember, Agile is about embracing change and dealing with it. Part of change is things will happen that will cause bugs that you didn't foresee, and the right reaction is, be comfortable enough with the testing tools that you can quickly find those bugs, write a test that reproduces the bug, and then make the test green. Then you've really fixed it, right? That's how you know you've really fixed a bug, is if you created a test that 
correctly failed to reproduce that bug, and then you went back and fixed the code to make those tests pass. Similarly, you don't want to say, well, unit tests give you better coverage, they're more thorough and detailed, so let's focus all our energy on that, as opposed to, oh, focus on integration tests, because they're more realistic, right? They reflect what the customer said they want, so if the integration tests are passing, by definition, we're meeting a customer need. Again, both extremes are kind of unhealthy, uh, because each one of these can find problems that would be missed by the other. So having a good combination of them is, is kind of what it's all about. Um, the last thing I want to leave you with, I think, in, in terms of testing, is uh, TDD versus what I call conventional debugging, i.e. the way that we all kind of do it, even though we say we don't, and we're all trying to get better, right? It's like we're all kind of in the gutter. Some of us are looking up at the stars trying to improve our practices. But having now lived with this for three or four years myself, and I'll be honest, three years ago I didn't do TDD. I do it now because I find that it's better. And here's my, my distillation of why I think it works for me. Uh, sorry, this, the colors are a little weird, but on the left column of the table says conventional debugging, and the right side says TDD. So what, you know, kind of what's the way I used to write code? And maybe some of you still do this, right? I write a whole bunch of lines, maybe a few tens of lines of code. I'm sure they're right. I mean, I'm a good programmer, right? This is not that hard. I run it. It doesn't work. OK, fire up the debugger. Start putting in printfs. If I had been using TDD, what would I do instead? Well, I'd write a few lines of code, having written the test first. So as soon as the test goes from red to green, I know that I wrote code that works, right? Or at least the parts of the behavior that I had in mind, those parts of the behavior work because I had a test. OK, back to conventional debugging. I'm running my program trying to find the bugs. So I start putting in printfs everywhere to print out the values of it, which, by the way, is a lot of fun when you're trying to read them out of the 500 lines of log output that you get in a Rails app, trying to find your printfs. You know, I'll, I know what I'll do. I'll put in 75 asterisks before and after. That'll make it readable. <laughs> Who do, OK, raise your hand if you don't do this. Thank you for your honesty. Okay? <laughs> or, or I could do the other thing. I could say, instead of printing the value of a variable, why don't I write a test that inspects it and sets an expectation with should, and I'll know immediately in bright red letters if that expectation wasn't met. OK, I'm back on the uh, conventional debugging side. I, I break out the big guns. I, I pull out the Ruby debugger. I set a debug breakpoint, and I now start tweaking and set. oh, let's see, I have to get past that if statement, so I have to set that thing. Oh, it's going to try to call that method, so I need to, no. I could instead, if I'm going to do that anyway, let's just do it in a file. I'll set up some mocks and stubs to control the code path, make it go the way I want. Um, and now, OK, I, for sure I fixed it. I'll get, get out of the debugger, run it all again. And of course, nine times out of 10, you didn't fix it. Or you kind of partly fixed it, but you didn't completely fix it. And now I have to do all these manual things all over again. Or I already have a bunch of tests, and I could just rerun them automatically. And I could, if some of them fail, oh, I didn't fix the whole thing. No problem. I'll just go back. So the bottom line is that you, know, you could do it on the left side, but you're using the same techniques in both cases, right? The only difference is in one case, you're doing it manually, which is boring and error prone. In the other case, you're doing a little bit more work, but you can make it automatic and repeatable and have you know, some high confidence that as you change things in your code, you're not breaking stuff that used to work. Um, and basically, it's more productive. Right? So you're doing all the same things, but with a, a kind of delta extra work, you're using your effort in, at uh, much higher leverage. So that's kind of my view of why TDD is a good thing. Right? It, it's really, it doesn't require new skills. It just requires to refactor your existing skills. I also tried when I, again, honest confessions, right? When I started doing this, I was like, OK, I'm going to be you know, teaching a course on Rails. I should really focus on testing. So I went back to some code I had written that was working. You know, it, it was decent code. And I started trying to write tests for it. And it was so painful because the code wasn't written in a way that was testable. Right? There were all kinds of interactions. There were like nested conditionals. And if you wanted to isolate a particular statement and, and have a test that triggered just that statement, the amount of stuff you'd have to set up in your test to make that happen. Remember when we talked about mock train wrecks? You have to set up all this infrastructure just to get one line of code. And you do that, and you go, God, testing is really not worth it. right? All, I, I wrote 20 lines of setup so that I could test two lines in my function. What that's really telling you, as I now realize, is your function is bad. It's a badly written function. It's not a testable function. It's got too many moving parts that, whose dependencies can't be broken. Right? There's no seams in my function that allow me to individually test the different behaviors. And once you start doing test-first development, because you have to write your tests in small chunks, it kind of makes this problem go away. So that's been my epiphany.